I think we're going to get started and I would um, like to welcome everyone to our and not well I guess the first in our 2016 series um, this is a social and behavioral research branch hosts um, scientists who are at the intersection of social and behavioral research um, genomics and health and today we have a wonderful person coming on to give a talk Dr. Megan Lewis in 1992, um, Dr. Lewis received her doctorate in social ecology from the University of California, Irvine. Um, she is currently the director of the Patient and Family Engagement Research Program in the Center for Communication Science at RTI International. In addition, Dr. Lewis holds an adjunct faculty position at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in the Gilling School of Global Public Health. Dr. Lewis has a unique expertise in health-related interpersonal communication. Um, that's where I know her work. She's um, been really formative in terms of the science that goes on in my group. Um, her research aims to leverage um, this expertise in applying um, social and behavioral science theory um, and health theory um, in the development of basic science as well as the development of interventions um, focusing on health promotion and disease management. Her research is distinguished by the use of um, dyadic and interpersonal theories as well as complex analytic methods um, to understand how cap, uh, couples and family functioning affect a wide array of health behavior and disease processes, including decisions related to genomics. So today, uh, Dr. Lewis uh, will share aspects of one of her current research um, efforts, the NC nexus study in which she is examining parental decision making processes that are related to genomic sequencing in newborns and children. Thanks Laura. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Thanks so much. Um, and I'll, I'll try to speak to the entire room although you are a little disadvantage over here on the left side. <laughs> Um, I, I want to say to everyone, it's, it's great to be here. I feel like I've said this before, I, I've kind of come home to a tribe that I didn't know that I was missing. Um, but it's really been great. Um, the NC Nexus study, which is one of the um, NSITE centers funded by NICHD and NHGRI, has really, really spawned my interest in genomic um, communication. And it's not something I had done before this particular project, but these are really challenging issues to address. Um, very sticky because not only is it difficult, as you know, to communicate genomic sequencing information, in the context of a family related to a newborn or young child, it gets even stickier in terms of the ethical, legal, um, social implication issues that, that, um, that revolve around this um, area. So I'm gonna be talking about some of my work that's related to the NC Nexus study. And um, people have asked me, hey, are you in the field? And we actually are not in the field quite yet. We just finished a year-long process of review with the FDA to get um, an investigational device exemption review completed. And we're granted that um, in last December, which we didn't really plan on having to do. That just kind of um, presented itself. And then we just have IRB. So I'm going to be talking about the formative work that's leading up to the, um, tr the trial that we're going to be launching in a couple of months. So to start, I want to acknowledge my project team members. Um, these are really the core team members at RTI and UNC. And besides these people, there are many, many other people who are involved in this project. And Cindy Powell and Jonathan Berg are the center co-PIs um, for the NC Nexus Center. And we have these combined areas of expertise along with many others because this really takes a village to build a decision aid to help support parents um, in this area of work. And I'm really not going to be talking about some of my more basic science, theoretical hypothesis testing work. This is really all about translational work. So how do we take the information that we know that might be evidence-based and translate it and use it in a way that's very accessible to parents when they're making decisions like this. Um, so that is, I'm coming from that perspective today. So I'm going to be talking about the NC Nexus um, aims and why um, it's important to look at these things. The challenges that we face as part of the work of the center, um, what we're doing to address those challenges. And I'm going to be talking about results in some formative qualitative interviews that we did with couples 
um, this is the dyadic part, um, and the descript, uh, discrete choice experiment that we did with parents was an online study. And then show you a little bit of the screenshots from the decision aid that we've developed based on health communication best practices and principles, as well as the formative work and experimental work. And then give you a little bit of clue what's the next step, which is the RCT. So the overarching center aims are here, is really to evaluate how next-gen sequencing is applied to the newborn screening can extend the current utility um, in newborn screening, uh, and to devise and evaluate a clinically oriented framework for analysis of NGS, NBS, and then develop best practices for incorporating it into clinical care. And so the center is made of three projects, as most centers are, and the first project is a sequencing project, and in that project is led by Jonathan Berg and they're um, developing a pipeline of whole exome sequencing data to study NGS-NBS and developing an Atlanta analytic strategy for what we're calling, and I'm saying is incidental findings here, but this isn't really incidental findings in the kind of context that we typically think of, like a diagnostic context. So here parents are actually making in, um, decisions about a whole wealth of information, so nothing is truly incidental in this context. Um, and then they're developing and evaluating novel bioinformatics approaches. Um, for NGS, NBS. The second project is the Clinical Implications Project, and they're looking at whole exome sequencing as a diagnostic tool that could be used in newborn screening um, and determining the capacity um, and utility of whole exome sequencing to extend the range and current um, newborn screening technologies. So there's emerging evidence that um, newborn sequencing and, and whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing could be applied to newborn screening, which is typically not genomic sequencing at this point. So there's emerging evidence that it would um, be applied in this area, but the um, full range of its applicability is still to be determined. So in this clinical study, three groups of children will be involved in the um, tr um, cohort study. So the first one is children who are zero to five who've already been diagnosed with one of four of these um, genetically based um, health conditions. The second cohort is a cohort of children with rare diseases, and um, these were added because there's a, there's a concern that will reach the end that's required, so the range of potential conditions were expanded. And then the third cohort is a well-child group, and these are newborns from birth to eight, uh, three months old who will also be, um, as part of the study with their parents, um, and this is the cohort where people sometimes, when I say this, go, oh, what are you doing? Like, how are, you, how are you ever going to do this um, in an ethically responsible way where you're getting parents' um, consent and um, approval to do genomic sequencing in their newborns? And that's one of the challenges that we're trying to um, address here. So the LC project is the third project, um, the Ethical Legal Social Implications Project. And in this project, we're trying to refine and describe in lay terms meaningful bins of um, genes and information that would enable parents to make informed decisions about what they want to learn, what results they want to get back about their um, child or newborn, um, to develop and evaluate the effectiveness of a decision aid. And so much of what I'm going to be talking about today is preparatory to that decision aid. And then apply the decision aid, and it's, it's mostly a randomized trial. I say controlled is a little bit um, of a, an overstatement here. And look at parents' um, decision to participate in the study and do when they if they, do they feel more informed and more comfortable consenting to have this type of sequencing done for their child, um, their willingness to accept um, genetic sequencing um, information for their child, the choices of the kinds of information that they want to learn as part of the study, and then the factors, the social and psychological factors associated with the parental choice, and then are there any consequences um, of the return of these kinds of results for children and families that are part of the study? So the children consequences is something we can't really study in the because um, it's a really short term follow up. But certainly for families, we're going to look at things like anxiety and um, those other kinds of short term consequences. So why is this important? So newborn screening is arguably is the most successful public health program that has ever existed. It identifies children with treatable conditions at birth um, and improves their health and survival. Um, it's rapidly expanding and changing as new technologies are available um, and new ge genetic discoveries come on board. Um, but the utility, and as I said, it's starting to emerge that there is some utility to the application of, of next generation sequencing to newborn screening. Um, but it, the, the, the real kind of nail in the coffin has still yet to be 
um, determine. And there's a lot of resistance in the newborn screening community to use new technologies beyond what is currently being used. And there's ethical issues as well. Like what do we do with all of the information that is generated from um, sequencing, if it was um, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, what do we do with that information when we're only focusing on a subset of conditions that are treatable? And so that's really at the core of what we're trying to understand at Nexus. So um, we really don't know about um, the consequence of parents for learning this kind of information. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we are trying to understand. And when I say, again, incidental information, that's kind of in quotes here. And so I think this is also an important issue because not only can you, you can get your child's genome sequence online now. You can go online, pay some money, um, probably a lot of money, um, but that cost is just, uh, declining, and you can get that information. And not only that, we, I was at a, a recent um, meeting at the Hastings Center last year, and there was a representative of 23andMe, and they said, well, we're not going to do newborn screening tomorrow. Um, which made it think, well, maybe the day after tomorrow that might be going on. And so there's a real strong momentum for industry pushing, pushing, pushing um, related to newborn screening and other kinds of conditions that might be treatable. So to me, it's incumbent on us as social and behavioral scientists to, to try to understand what are the consequences and what can we do to support families. So really, I'm focusing here on the translational challenges. So we know that um, the application of next, uh, next generation sequencing in the pediatric population really requires a special examination of these um, ethical challenges and the clinical benefits. Um, and really, how do we surprise, provide support for families that are making these decisions now? Um, and then how do we handle the disclosure of other information that is available to them once they um, learn these things, like carrier status, um, genetic susceptibility to childhood onset conditions that are not treatable, or genetic susceptibility to adult um, onset diseases that or that are treatable or not. So all of these are kinds of information that people could learn um, if they started to embark down this road. Um, and so another issue that's come up a lot when I present this, um, um, this study is that how can you let parents make these choices when really you are undermining the child's autonomy? And the child should be able to make these decisions when they get older. And so I think these are real concerns. Bioethicists are very concerned about um, undermining autonomy, increasing potential risk. Um, and of course, I don't, I'm speaking to the choir here when I say the amount of information is absolutely huge. How do we communicate that information in a way that at least in the baby steps when we're doing this, and I, I didn't mean that as a pun, um, is, is uh, maybe I'm getting like the, the you know, the psychological inf you know, influence of this little baby here. Um, but when we go, that we can really reduce this information in a meaningful way that, that um, people can make informed decisions. You know, this information is uncertain and conditional. Um, and parents must make mutual joint decisions about this information. Our IRB has ruled in previous studies and in this study that if both parents are reasonably available, they must be part of the consenting process and they must be part of the joint decision making process about what types of information that they want to learn. Now, if a parent is, one per, per, parent is deployed to Iraq or has some other, is not available, then the remaining parent can make those decisions by themselves. So, you know, it depends. And some of the really formative qualitative data that we have is shedding light on the kinds of mutual and joint, joint decisions that parents are comfortable making. So what are we doing to address these challenges? So in the first project, project one, Jonathan um, Berg is adapting some of his um, previous work, developing an age-based metric system that will help us classify the really um, huge amount of genetic information into smaller chunks or bins. Um, we're developing a decision aid to support parental decision making. And of course, there's a, the hypothesis in the RCT, will this help people? Will it make them feel more informed? Will they make choices that match their values and beliefs or not? That's still um, to be determined. And we're conducting formative work and user-centered work and experimental work to develop a decision aid that should, um, if all the evidence about decision aids is true, help them make more informed decisions about their choices to participate in the study and about the types of information that they want to learn. And then, of course, we're going to be evaluating this um, decision aid in the RCT. So this is the age-based modified metric system. So on the y-axis is medical actionability, and on the x-axis is the onset of a genetic um, condition. And so in this quadrant here is next generation newborn sequencing. And so and um, then there's um, childhood onset, non-medically actionable, adult onset, medically actionable, and adult onset, non-medically actionable conditions. So what happens for a gene um, variant to get into one of these bins or buckets is a 
extensive review process, very systematic, is undertaken, and a bidding committee meets and discusses the evidence, um, treatments that are available, when is the age of onset, which is, can be very murky, because for many conditions, some of the symptoms are not well known because we don't have a knowledge base about some of them, um, because um, it's not caught early enough. And this group process then scores each of these genes in a systematic process, and they're placed into one of these categories. So in the NC Nexus study, um, parents will have available to them next generation newborn screening conditions and others like them. So childhood onset conditions that have some medical treatment or actionability. They will have um, available to them, depending on their study group, um, childhood onset non-medically actionable conditions if they would like to make that choice and they're in that particular study group. And they will have adult onset medically actionable child, um, conditions as well um, as a choice point and then also carrier status. They will not be able to learn adult onset non-medically actionable conditions for their child. Um, and that was a decision that was made for you know, a lot of different reasons, primarily ethical issues, which is what, what benefit um, does that provide for the family um, at this um, very young point in time? And maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, all these things will be actionable. So I want to tell you a little bit about the formative qualitative studies we did with couples. And so, um, and we did this really in a very um, tested, we tested materials and asked open-ended questions about all aspects of the study and about messaging we were going to be using in the decision aid. And we really wanted to understand how they communicated and made decisions about these kinds of screening and testing results for their child and newborn and what characteristics of the conditions um, parents find important when deciding to learn this information about their child. So the sample was 33 couples who were married or in a committed relationship, and we had some nice balance across race. We also were interested, would there be differences based on pregnancy status? So is someone pregnant? Did they have a recent birth? Or did they already have some previous experience with genetic testing because of some childhood condition that they were grappling with with their child? And um, so really the, the N here is, is 66 because we're working with dyads here. Um, but I can tell you off the bat, <clears throat> there's no difference between pregnant, recent birth, or child, childhood um, experience. When we looked at the themes that were generated from the qualitative um, study. So we had some balance by race and gender. The average age of participants was 35. Most were more highly educated. Um, even distribution across um, income categories, and most people were working for pay. People completed um, a brief questionnaire, um, and then they engaged in a pretty in-depth 90-minute in-person interview with both couple members present. And we asked about their general knowledge um, and opinions. We gave them definitions of the categories of information we would be using and asked for their feedback. We asked why or, they, or why not they would not choose this kind of information, um, what they would want to know, um, and then how they would work together to make these kinds of decisions should they choose um, to learn them. And then we also had them fill out decision worksheets separately. So we asked each of them to fill out categories of information of the kinds that I just told you about. So childhood actionable conditions and newborn screening things, um, childhood um, non-medically actionable conditions, um, adult actionable conditions, and then carrier status. And we weren't going to you know, provide the adult onset non-treatable or non-actionable conditions, but we were curious what parents would, how they would react to this information. So we did include these in the interviews, um, although they won't have that information available to them in the Nexus study. So they completed these things um, separately, and then they shared their answers. And um, part of what I'm going to be talking about today is related to the coding of these communications. And then we have um, two papers that are coming from this that are going to be under review quite soon that look at kind of the communication dynamics among them and then um, some of the information I'm going to be um, presenting about their collaboration and their agreement about this, these categories of information. So we audio recorded and transcribed the, um, the interviews used in vivo. We developed codebook. We refined. We coded. We refined. Um, anyone who does qualitative work knows that you code and refine a lot. We looked at reliability um, and did all the kinds of things you would do when you want to have a nice systematic qualitative study. And then we used a framework analysis approach to um, look at themes and, um, that emerged through the course of these interviews. So the first thing I want to present is the decision results. Because um, to me, this is a really interesting part of the study. 
So we had 33 couples. So most said yes, they would participate in a study like NC Nexus with the, the kinds of information that we provided in our informed decision consenting brochure, which is part of a long set of decision aids that are part of this study. But not everyone did. They said they would need more information. And many of the times that information they wanted was like logistics and nuts and bolts. And, and very commonly, like, how is this information going to be stored and is it private? Is it going to be an electronic medical record? Some of these people were very savvy. As you can imagine, some parents who've had some um, experience working with their child who has a genetic disorder. So most said, you know, they would want traditional newborn screening information and similar conditions, although there was some that, that they could not arrive at a mutual decision um, about that kind of information, even though these were kinds of things that parents get back on a, in a routine way. Um, would they want childhood onset conditions with no medical treatment? And so here's where we start to see a little bit of breakdown that they might say no, they don't know, no mutual decision, or there's just not enough information to make decisions about that. Um, adult onset conditions with medical treatment, here's again where it starts to break down just a little bit, where they'd say don't know, or they couldn't arrive at a mutual decision in the course of these interviews to be able to make a, a, you know, a simulated decision in this context. Um, adult onset conditions with no treatment, um, here's again where there was a very big difference, where there was a lot of couples who said we couldn't reach a mutual decision or it's no, um, or we don't know. There was a lot more indecision um, uh, um, in comparison to the other categories. And carrier status as well was a place where it started to break down. And there was, you know, do we need to know this information and why would we find it beneficial? And so one of the contributions of this, just even this table, is when we've started to work in this area is many times the question is, do you want this information, genomic sequencing information, yes or no? And we find even in adults and sometimes in um, parental decision making, people uniformly say, yes, I want to know this information. But when you start to break it down into categories of information um, based on actionability and age of onset, the, the conversation starts to change a bit and people start to refine their answers um, um, a little bit more. So that's one of the contributions that we're finding with our qualitative work. So we also looked at the themes about the gen, um, decision to receive this kind of information. And we looked at reasons for and reasons against. And so these are overall the categories. And we found that there's benefits to the child, there's benefits to the parents, um, you know, that they liked that the information would be confidential, but there was some concern we, but that they wanted the information to be used to help other children. Um, and there was practical implications about the study that they liked, that it's free and they get, you know, wow, I get to get my child's genome sequenced, yay. Um, and then there was pros and um, our example of cons and risks. Um, there was aspects of the sequencing that really disturbed them when we described it, like, are these tests accurate? How do we know what's really happening in, in terms of false positives or false negatives? Um, that, you know, there's, there are conditional kinds of information that are being presented to them. So we don't really know how something would, serious would be in the future. Um, they were concerned about psychological harm, stress, breach of confidentiality. There was a variety of values of beliefs that um, parents um, discussed as um, either being, in some cases, against doing something like this. You know, why should we do this now unless we have a reason to know this information? So there was a variety of kinds of um, information that emerged the themes related to parental decision making. When we looked across the different categories of information, we found a kind of, I would say, a similar pattern in this qualitative data, which is when you look at medically actionable childhood conditions, there's a few things, yeah, this is great, we would do this. We can't really think of a huge number of, of risks to doing this. But as we get to these kinds of things that are like um, a non-medically actionable adult onset or carrier status, there was more uncertainty. Um, there was more concern. And what we're doing with these, um, we call these values and beliefs, the verbatim values and beliefs that we learned in the course of these interviews are actually fed into the decision aid. And so there's a values sorting um, exercise that parents go through and they are able to sort their uh, values and beliefs that come from this formative work and then input their own into the decision, as, decision aid as a way to help their decision making process. So, our conclusions from this work and some other themes that I'm not um, presenting right now is that couples really desire making collaborative decisions. Um, it, was, it was mentioned more than once that like I would hate to make this decision by myself, but in fact we will have single parents who want to participate in this study making um, uh, this decision by themselves. And so one hypothesis could be is do parents when they make these decisions outside the social context experience more distress or more anxiety as a result of that decision making. Um, agreement declines with greater uncertainty. 
Um, and there's many, many different values or perceptions of risks and benefits that we can use in the context of a decision aid to help people clarify what might be important to them to help them make more informed decisions. So the other, um, I want to call it formative work, although this was a pretty large formative study, is that we launched a discrete choice experiment, which was an online study, to greater understand parental preferences in this context. And so discrete choice experiments are valuable methods for understanding information preferences and how people trade off risks and benefits um, in a kind of comparative approach. It's an economic method that's used a lot by economists. You know, like how much are you willing to pay for this drug is a very common application of this method. It reveals how people value various attributes or characteristics or issues related to a problem relative to other characteristics and attributes. Um, it's, it's useful for studying highly correlated attributes, which is probably most of the social world. Um, and we use this really to engage parents as a way to understand these characteristics of, of genetic conditions that might help drive their decision making. So we identified attributes of genetic health conditions that might be related to parental preferences based on a systematic review that was actually done around newborn sequencing. Um, and then we were going to use some of this information to inform the development of our decision aid and develop messaging around it. Um, and then just to build the evidence base around parental decision making for next generation sequencing because there's um, not a lot of information um, in this area. And we specifically focused in our study on um, non-treatable childhood conditions because there's not a lot of experience for parents making those kinds of conditions. Um, so we defined these attributes and attribute levels for the course of this um, experiment. And again, part of this was based on the systematic review, part was based on clinical input from the genetic counselors and geneticists um, that um, are part of this team. And um, we did a lot of formative work in cognitive testing. Um, of these attributes and levels as well to make sure that people clearly understood what we were talking about. So we looked at the chance that something would develop and define these attributes uh, with 90% chance, 75, 50, and 10. The age of onset, would it be less than one year all the way to um, adulthood? The speed that the condition might get wor worse, rapid, moderate, slow, and stable, and so on. And so we manipulated all of these um, attributes and levels in our discrete choice experiment. So we used a de-optimal design. Please don't ask me about the logistics of this because I was working with a really uh, well-trained economist to do the design and some of the analysis. And um, the wonderful Ryan Paquin, who many of you know, was also involved in this analysis. I feel so fortunate to have him as part of our team. Um, and so people were randomly assigned to complete eight choice questions that showed two different profiles of a genetic condition, profile A or profile B. And we randomly vary the attributes and characteristic levels across um, these different profiles and across the sample of the people who are in the study and then use the conditional logit regression to estimate the implicit decision weights um, or preference weights that might be consistent with a pattern of choices, again, across the sample. Um, because if we were going to ask people to make all possible comparisons, those people would still be doing the study. I mean, they'd still be, and we'd still be slogging through. So, um, there's nice ways that we can look at balance across the design. So this, again, was an online sample of over 1,200 parents who had a child under age five. We were very interested in race and gender differences. And in this study design, it's um, my understanding is if you want to look at subgroup differences, you basically double your sample. So we had a really big, hefty sample, anticipating that we would find race and gender differences. Um, but I can give you a peek under the hood, which is we didn't find big race and gender differences. And I think it, it could be a result of using the online panel versus a community-based survey uh, panel um, or cohort, but that's something we still are interested in exploring. We didn't find any differences based on some of the kinds of measures that we took for medical mistrust or numeracy and literacy um, and some other kinds of things that you typically might um, expect to find. So um, we're still exploring that as well. So parents had to be 18 to 40. They had to have a child under five and speak English, and again, stratified by race and gender. And so our sample turned out to be mostly married, not surprising, but also a large um, component of um, single parents as well. There was representation across educational levels, which I think is um, good, and employment, most people were employed. So people entered the survey um, 
and then they're given information and characteristics about the attributes and levels. And so again, we did really extensive cognitive testing of this survey before we ever launched it. And then when people come into the survey, there is a period of training basically to, to help them understand what we're going to ask them to do. And so they said, okay, what's a risk array? So we told them what a risk array was and we explained it. And you said, what do we mean by um, a condition that has the age of onset? We explain that and then we give them a practice question. So by the time they get to the actual experiment, they've been in the survey for quite a while. And that training helps them make those comparisons in a pretty, um, and it, I think it worked very well in um, our case. So again, we focus on non-medically actionable genetic conditions, which we define for them. And um, we looked at those seven attributes with the varying levels um, that I presented in a previous slide. And then they were presented with the eight trade-off questions, which said, which genetic test report would you be most important, would be most important to you to learn if you had this type of information to choose from? And then they answered these psychosocial and demographic um, questions. So here's an example of one of the um, profiles that they might have as part of this study. And they answered eight of these. And so we varied, again, the different um, attributes along this, um, along this column here. And then the, the age of onset, you can see, is 1 to 5 or 5 to 12 in this example. And they were given, you know, here's the chance that it would develop. And so these types of things, they made eight of these choices. Um, as the part of the experiment. And then the dependent variable that I'm going to talk about today is which would be more important for you to know, profile A or profile B. And so then we looked at these comparisons across the sample to, def to, to figure out what is the most important thing that parents want to know um, based on the kinds of profiles that they were viewing. Oh, good, this slide came out. This is one of the slides. I had a little slide crisis this morning that came out all jumbled like a um, scrambled egg, but thankfully it looks good here. So this is just overall the condition attributes, um, just overall um, without regard to the levels of those attributes. And we found that the likelihood that some, something would um, occur was by far the most important thing that parents wanted to know um, if they had these profiles to choose from. And so that clearly was most important for their decision making. And then um, quality of life um, was not important of all on the other end of the spectrum. The level of physical and mental disabilities was also important, as was the age of onset and the lifespan, the, the impact on lifespan of this genetic condition. So it was interesting that quality of life didn't work here. At first, we thought maybe there's like some kind of you know, subgroup differences. We looked at all kinds of things. Um, I just don't think that attribute might have worked but it wasn't um, important in this study. And then we looked not just at overall, but we looked at the levels of the attributes. And I have to say, this is the most orderly data set I have ever emerged from. With, um, and so what we found is that there were significant differences between each of the levels that we looked at, except in a couple of cases. So when the age of onset was less than a year or one to five, there was no significant differences there or when it was, uh, the rate of progression was stable or slow. I'm sorry, I'm very, not very good with this little pointer. Um, and then a quality of life, um, uh, available treatments for that was not significant. But in all other cases, there were statistically significant differences in these preference rates across the different levels that we examined. We also looked, and we, as a kind of a manipulation check, we looked at distress levels. So we asked people to rate the distress levels of these varying levels um, and, and variables that we looked at. And so shortened life stamp, lifespan was clearly on average, there we go, much more distressing than a uh, normal lifespan and so on. And so that provided to us kind of a nice um, check that actually people were perceiving these very, um, attributes and levels that we had defined kind of a priori in a way that we thought was important um, for their decision making. So clearly people want to learn more distressing information that is more likely to occur, which was surprising to a group of genetic counselors that I presented this information at last fall. They predicted the exact opposite. So it was really um, an interesting discussion we had around that. So differences by gender and race. We examined these because we we're very interested in would we find differences by gender and race based on um, differences you see in the literature. And it really didn't change the main pattern of results that we were finding. There was a magnitude of preferences um, as, as outlined here, but really the main pattern of results was the same across all of these subgroups. So compared to mothers, fathers cared less about learning information that had a smaller chance of developing or was less likely, to uh, less likely to decrease lifespan, or was characterized as severe physical disability. 
um, and compared to white pre uh, participants, African American participants cared more about learning information that had a smaller chance of developing, was unlikely to affect a child's lifespan, or could result in a severe mental disability. And I present these, but really the main pattern of findings is our story. Um, but here, these are small little differences, but the magnitude of results is all the same. So our conclusion really is that parents, when it's something about a, a non-treatable childhood disorder, parents want to learn that information, even if it's distressing, um, and it's highly likely to occur. And we, we believe that is, to the case, that is the case based on our qualitative data, which shows that parents are very interested in things that have personal utility, even if there is no clinical or medical actionability related to those um, conditions. Um, so here we go at the conclusions. I've already, I think, gone over most of those um, um, with you. So all this information is preparatory to the development of a decision aid. And so the problem is, um, and this is a problem that's facing most genomic sequencing studies, is that when we consent people into studies, typical consent forms are cumbersome, they're confusing, they're long, they complain terminology and jargon, they're at a very high literacy level, they require lengthy individual interactions to complete, um, and they really don't provide knowledge or information about the study. And this isn't just, I mean, this is pervasive in all areas of science, not just here, but it's especially acute with um, genomic sequencing studies because Bill is not a, a, an, an idea or a methodology that's really accessible to people, but we know it will be as precision medicine rolls out, as genomic sequence information becomes more prevalent and available in the society. So traditional consent models are going to be problematic when next generation sequencing is more pervasive um, in research and in practice in population studies. And so part of what we're trying to do in the NC Nexus study and as part of the Insight Consortium is to look at can we use a decision aid to help ease the burden in the consent process. So our approach is the decision aid. So it explains genomic information at as lay level as possible. And I have to say, as lay level as possible, because there's a lot of tension between what I would like to be a lay level and the precision that clinicians really want, because they see, you know, they really believe that people need to know really detailed information to make an informed decision. And so this is an um, ongoing debate. And it's one thing I think we're going to find out in this study um, is what kind of information do people really need to know to make informed decision. So we applied communication science strategies and best principles for clear communication, plain language, and health literacy as much as we possibly could. We used text, graphics, and audio to convey challenging concepts. Um, and used a little bit of animation of how things move on to the um, slides that people see as part of the decision aid. And we included a value clarification exercise because many studies show that when people engage in a process of values clarification, they come to a decision sometimes where they feel more comfortable with it and experience less distress. Now, they may not consent to the study. And in fact, in one of our previous studies on newborn screening um, related to Fragile X, we had lower consent rates to screening for Fragile X once pe um, parents completed a decision aid that was related more to like an informed decision-making approach rather than just a typical consenting. And we were okay with that. So we think it meets participants' needs better because it facilitates this informed decision. It could make enrollment easier and it just re reduces burden all the way around. And it will reduce the burden for study staff as well, which tend to be in many of these studies genetic counselors who are on the front line consenting people into studies. So decision support tools, if people haven't used them, tend to be evidence-based educational approaches that um, provide a very personalized focus for people to weigh options and outcomes um, when they're making decisions. And so it's typically applied in context when there is no best course, right? So for some medical treatments, and decision aids are typically applied when there's um, no best medical treatment. Like, what should I do? Should I get this treatment or that treatment or no treatment? Um, and so decision aids are used in an individual or shared decision-making context to help um, people make those decisions. And so we thought th this could be, this framework could be applied in this context because whether people participate in the study really is an individual choice or a dyadic choice, you know, there's really no really hardcore benefit for them to participate in except maybe they just want to. So there's an evidence-based um, uh, literature that supports their use. And it really engages people in the process of decision making. People have to be more actively engaged um, rather than just like, oh my gosh, here's another page of medical terminology. Where, is the, where do I sign? Boom, boom, boom. Not even knowing what they've signed. And so it really focuses on kind of this deliberative healthcare choice that people can make. And in the context of Nexus, 
um, they would affirm their decisions in the decision aid, but then they would um, go through a process and meet with a genetic counselor before they're actually um, consented um, completely into the study. So how do we gather parental input for the decision aid? So we use these best practices. We use the international um, IPDAS standards, which I have to say was something we proposed initially and became actually very challenging to apply in our case because those IPDAS standards were developed with um, very specific one gene or one kind of treatment in mind. We're talking about massive categories of information, of uncertain information, and so it was very challenging to apply those standards. We followed an iterative development process of testing and refining. We applied these plain language principles, as I mentioned. We did user testing with the decision aid once there were, um, we had it developed to test areas of confusion related to content and navigation. And we um, allow people to go at their own pace. They can repeat and review information as needed. So it's not like there's a timed kind of, um, you know, you have 10 minutes to do this. And they can, they do it at home or they can do it in the clinic um, on um, pro uh, laptops or tablets that we provide. So the decision aid actually contains four sections. Um, and this is a screenshot of one of the sections. Um, there's traditional newborn screening um, conditions and similar other conditions that are treatable in childhood. Then there's a, um, and you know, what the NC Nexus study is about is also included in that um, section. There's non medically actionable childhood conditions that are described, and people have provided education about that. There's medically actionable adult onset conditions and carrier status. So each of these sections is parallel to each other. There's some um, preparatory knowledge and education, there's risk grades that are presented. Um, people kind of, we ask them which way they're leaning to get at their intentions, there's values clarification, and then they're asked to basically make a decision. Do you want to learn this type of information about your child? And there's also, um, in the very first step in the decision aid, there's a tutorial. And so this is a screenshot of the tutorial about how you would drag and drop things. Um, we talk in this specific examples about newborn screening and genomic sequencing, what the study is about, as I said, reasons for and against, and the decision and next steps. And so we describe in pretty um, detailed um, ways what would happen if people participate in the study um, when they're in this first step of the decision aid. So we, what we think makes this tool unique is that it's iterative and can be applied, uh, applied across multiple platforms. So laptops, tablets, desktops, um, on some phones, but not iPhones, um, but iPads. It got to be a little bit cumbersome in terms of this testing, but apparently Apple has not agreed to use something on iPhones, which makes it very um, problematic for the use of that. Um, it's theory driven in the extent that it accounts for risk communication and other kinds of uh, communication from health um, communication research. It's input from both users and clinicians, plain language as much as possible. It has the iterative value sorting exercise that's shown here on this um, screenshot. And it um, has a, had an iterative user-centered design and testing process. And I think this is really important because this is the translational part. If I was really doing a theory, just a totally theory-driven, hypothesis-driven study, I probably or maybe would have used a different approach. But we're finding again and again and again with all the digital tools that we're developing that we absolutely have to have people's input on the tool. Um, and it, it makes it better, it makes it more accessible to them, um, it's just all around better. Um, but I have to say, it's, it's challenging sometimes to convince people that this is absolutely the way to go. So here are screenshots about condition category description and a risk array. Um, so this is medically actionable childhood condition. And so what happens is all of these um, little bars here are not on the screen at once. So there's narration um, that happens, and the narration almost exactly maps to things that are shown on the screen. And these bars come down just one at a time in sync with the narration. And so here's an example of a risk array um, related to newborn screening. And it, this is the progress bar as it goes around and they can hit um, going to the next screen. So they have to move forward themselves. They can't stop. Um, it, they have to, to push it forward, which is a, another way to engage people um, in the process. Um, here's difficult, and this is actually, when I saw it, is actually not the final one, but we've tried to use graphics um, to communicate genomic sequencing information that might be challenging. Because of the platform that we use, we couldn't use animation, which of course would be way more um, useful in this particular context. We also use hoverovers, so anything that has a blue, 
they can click on and then they get a more what I would call a more lay language definition um, if they would like it. Um, here is again is an example where we talk about more about the logistics of the study. Um, and then in addition to the value sorting, there's questions that we prompt them to consider. And then they could put in yes and no, yes and no, yes and no, depending on what they um, want to provide as a way to either spark discussion between the couple or to have someone who's an individual filling this out think about some of these questions. So are you prepared to learn this information that might be medically actionable information um, about childhood conditions, yes or no? With the idea, and then these answers are populated on the next screen and fed back to them as a way to prompt their awareness, engagement, and decision making. Here is a screenshot um, that's actually not the best screenshot, but it shows a, 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 a summary of the values clarification exercises, so reasons for and reasons against. And what happens is they sort through values, and then a summary is shown to them. Um, as a way to summarize for them and to think about um, what is important to them is to either get the sequencing or to choose certain kinds of information. So this is um, how they record their decisions. And as I said, prior to this, prior to the value sorting exercise, we have a same slider scale. So this um, arrow measures, it will, can slide across this bar, and it actually has numbers that show when it slides. And so even though these are really categorical decisions that people are making, we did this as a way to see if we could somehow capture finer grained intentions and decisions. Like, yes, I definitely want to do that, and I'm going to put it all the way over here on this side, or yeah, I kind of want it over here. Um, and so we're going to look at kind of pre-post values clarification as a way to see do people's intentions change with their decision. So the next step is the NC Nexus randomized trial where we'll have 400 parents who participate and use the decision aid as well as work with a genetic counselor to make these decisions. So all consenting parents will be able to make decisions about um, newborn screening conditions and others that are treatable in childhood. And then about two thirds, we did a, an uneven randomization um, because this is a pilot study um, and will be randomly assigned to um, additional decision categories that I've talked about. So carrier status, non-medically um, actionable, and adult actionable. And they can choose one, none, or all of those. So they don't have to choose any like permutation of those categories of decisions um, to be a part of the study. We're looking at decision confidence, conflict, distress, and other outcomes that are monitored over a very short follow-up period. Um, and then, again, we're hoping that we can get more funding to look at people longer over time. And so this will really allow us to evaluate if a decision aid helps support informed decision making in this context. Um, and it could be a useful tool not only to support parents, but genetic counselors and others who are going to be involved in these um, large population-based studies as we move forward. So I'm going to end there, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Yes? No. So the question was, um, will there be people who will use a decision aid and not have access to a genetic counselor, which I think is a good decision. That would be, in some ways, the full design, right, to look at that comparison. And we thought, for ethical reasons, we don't know the effectiveness of the decision aid at this point, and we don't know the needs of parents, so that we thought we wouldn't do that. Um, that could be a really interesting next step, is now, if we have some, we know this helps, what happens to people consent without the access to that interpersonal communication? Do they have that same level of confidence, maybe, or informed choice making that, that, that we may learn about? But that's a really, really good question. But we're not in this study for mostly ethical reasons. Yes? Yeah, and so it's a pretty complicated design. And so really, um, it's it's basically four months overall, but when you there's a really long lag for some of the return of these results for the processing of the information. So it's actually probably a little bit longer. Um, this is the goal. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to achieve that goal. I mean, there's a lot of information. This to me is a lot of people um, to be processing that kind of information on. So we will see how long that lag tends to be, um, but that's. That's the standard that we're, we're trying to get at. And, um, and it's mostly we're, we're backing up against now we're in year three. So we're also backing up against um, the end of the, the five-year grant period. Yes? So right now, current newborn screening is 
Exactly. The way you're setting this up, the choice of setting the engagement or streaming type you know, information is sort of on par with the other categories. Was there any discussion mm -hmm. about whether there should be a more strongly worded encouragement or whether people might not even be able to opt out of uh, that sort of information? Right. So that's why we decided that everyone should be able to have access to, and, and I should make it clear, everyone who has a newborn in the study will get traditional newborn screening. Um, and then there's lots of methodological issues that they're interested in examining when they compare traditional newborn screening with the, the next generation sequencing that will be done. Um, that's why we wanted everyone to have access to that decision-making category, almost like it was a traditional newborn screening kind of thing. Everyone has access to making decisions about medically actionable conditions in childhood, um, if I understand your um, question correctly. Now, people could get to the point where they opt out. So at any point in this study, people can drop out. They can even do the sequencing, which will be done by a swab in the baby's mouth or the child's mouth. Um, I think so. That's both in co both cases with a swab. Um, but they can even have the sequencing done and choose not to learn it. So there's lots of different places along the line where people can opt out of the study. Um, but we wanted it to be kind of like newborn screening might be, which is everyone has that option. But we couldn't really force them to, to have that. I doubt the FDA would allow that. And I'm, I'm sure our IRB would not, not allow that either. But you're right. It's It's... It's, it's really interesting the kinds of debates that we have in the Insight Consortium about the public health significance of the application of this technology to newborn screening because it brings up so many issues about opting in and opting out. Um, and so we're doing some other work that's separate from this, looking at elective panels of um, a genomic sequence, or not even genomic sequencing, but elective panels um, that would supplement newborn screening information. And, and some of you, I know, all know Holly P.A., and Holly and I are working with Don Bailey on that project, which is basically to have a tier two screening system um, that we're hoping to implement in North Carolina. <clears throat> Other questions? Great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it and happy to talk with anyone individually. Thanks so much.